everybody's smiling face. Again, I um, hope everybody is better and feeling well. We're still continuing to pray for Darby. Um, but we're going to get right into worship today. And, you know, three weeks, it kind of, you know, stopped to be away. But I said all along, even though we lost, felt like we lost some momentum going into um, this new year, that God still has a plan for this church, for this community, and for your lives as well. We're just going to um, sing his praises today. Um, you can find a place to stand or sit. But, um, you know, just... Take this time to really just dwell in in his presence and surrender whatever you're holding on to, to him today. Let's sing together. Thank you. 
Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and all and people brought to him all who were ill and various uh, ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them all. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Ordinary people were going about their ordinary lives before an invitation changed their lives forever. Have you ever thought about your one decision? I guess from a radically different direction for your life. Like most of the time we make safe, ordinary decisions, but sometimes there's big decisions that change everything. I remember when Darby and I were praying over uh, where to go to start a church. I knew it was somewhere in the Northeast that God was calling me to, and we took some time to pray and fast. And I remember after that time praying and fasting separately, we both came back together and sat down, and we both were down for the open. And that was a decision that radically changed the trajectory of my life. You wouldn't be sitting here today. I wouldn't even know you. I wouldn't even know you exist if I had made that decision. It radically changed my life. And we're all one decision away from a radically different trajectory for our lives. Now, uh, Jesus wasn't the first rabbi to recruit disciples. In first century Israel, there were many rabbis traveling throughout the country, teaching a way of life based on the Old Testament. And they would recruit followers to learn their teachings and to train new disciples. But what is unique about Jesus is that a rabbi would usually go into a synagogue and be like, who's the best student in your synagogue? Who has the Old Testament memorized? They just know this in and out. I want them to be my disciple. Jesus didn't do that. He went out to ordinary people doing ordinary jobs, and he said, I want you. He recruited ordinary people doing, doing ordinary, everyday things. And all the gospel authors mention this. The first disciples of Jesus were not the scholarly, they weren't the religious, they weren't the rich, the powerful, or the wise, they were ordinary people, just like me, and just like you. Those are the people that Jesus is looking for. Becoming a follower of Jesus isn't reserved for the elite, it isn't reserved for only the righteous, you know, the best of the best, it is available to the willing, who want it. Now Peter first calls Peter and Andrew, Peter has two names, you probably heard that here, Simon, and Peter. Sometimes he's just called Simon Peter to uh, differentiate from other Simons. Um, but in this time, many people had a Jewish name if they were an Israelite. Simon's a Jewish name. But they also had a Greco-Roman name so that when they talked to people outside of their culture, they could interact with them without sounding like a foreigner. And that was his name, Petros, or Peter. Um, just like now, if occasionally you'll call up somebody on the phone and uh, they're like clearly from a different country than you are, and they're like, hey, my name's John. You're like, maybe, maybe John. I remember I had a friend when I went to India, and he kept trying to get me to say his name right, and I butchered it all the two weeks over there. I kept butchering it. I'm like, I'm so sorry. It was a beautiful name. And uh, I kept butchering it, kept butchering it. Finally, he said, just call me Samson. You know, like, he's like, you can say Samson. And I was like, I'm so sorry I can't say your name. So I called him Samson. And I've called him Samson uh, since then. Um, it's kind of like that. So the Greco-Romans were like, Simon, what a weird name. So Peter went by Petra, so Peter. John chapter 1 reports that Andrew had followed John the baptizer and had encountered Jesus before at the Jordan River when Jesus was baptized. And he had even introduced Peter to Jesus previous to this. So now that Jesus had been kicked out of his hometown and moved to Capernaum, he goes and looks up these guys that he met previously, and he invites them to follow him. And the result of that invitation is to leave something in order to receive something. To follow Jesus was an invitation to have un unlimited access to a rabbi, to an invitation to become lifelong students of the way of life that the rabbi taught. A disciple was expected to have unwavering support for the rabbi. And they would go where the rabbi went and do what the rabbi did. And Jesus makes this peculiar promise here. He promises to make them fishers of men. Now, growing up in the uh, the South. My family moved down from Pittsburgh when I was a kid to Tennessee. They weren't religious. My mom ended up taking my sister and I to church because she was like, we have a last name like Hanovich. We stand out. Like, you're not going to make any friends in school. Like, they're going to make fun of you. And so she's like, we'll go to this church and maybe you'll make some friends. And she heard about Jesus for the first time and she said, you know what? I'm all in on this. I'm going to become a follower of Jesus. And so my family started attending churches and 
I started hearing this thing. Anytime someone came to this passage, um, I would often hear, hear people say things like, Jesus wants us all to be fishers of men. Um, and I think their, their principle is true. But he didn't use that phrase with Matthew, the tax collector. He didn't say, Matthew, I'm going to make you a fisher of so men. You know? He didn't use that with Simon the Zealot or Judas or any of the other non-fisherman disciples. He just uses it with Andrew and Peter. And I remember uh, this passage growing up, preachers would usually use some metaphor for modern-day bass fishing, which would usually be an excuse to put up a picture of them with a really impressive fish. Uh, this was going to be better if I had time to better. But... Um, this is my really impressive catch here. This was actually a state record for world's smallest fish. Um, <laughs> and I caught this here in Delco. But um, they were using an excuse to put up a big picture of some huge bass fish that they thought and draw parallels to modern day fishing. But fishing in the first century looked very, very different. Um, they didn't have rods or reels, they had nets. And uh, I just don't think it's a good metaphor to draw connections to that because. Jesus didn't use this phrase with any of his other disciples. Fishing was very different in the first century, and I don't think that's the point Jesus was even trying to make here. They were already fishermen, but he was going to make them fishermen for men, fishermen for mankind, fishermen for the world. Jesus wanted to make them fishermen for others when they were currently fishermen for themselves. Just like Jesus wants to make us teachers for others. Teachers for mankind, or janitors for mankind, network engineers for mankind, or scientists, or web designers, whatever for mankind. One of our modes of discipleship in life is to begin to live for others and begin to see the work that we do as work to build the kingdom of God. Not just work to satisfy our needs, to have our wants met, but to actually see our work as working in step with Jesus to change the world. We begin as disciples, as followers of Jesus, to, to stop asking what we do, uh, what we want, and to start asking what does the world need. Jesus wants to recast our destiny, not defined by our career, but to, be, for, to help us begin to see our careers as avenues in dismantling the kingdom of darkness and instituting the kingdom of Christ. Now, we often assume the work of God gets done in the church. Like, oh man, that's where the really important work gets done, in church. But you know what? We spend roughly 45 minutes here a week, and sometimes we go three weeks without spending 45 minutes here, right? We spend 20 minutes online watching something. Uh, that is not where God does his primary work, because that's not where you primarily spend your time. God is primarily working in our lives every single day in the ordinary moments of our day. Now, it's good to come here, get encouraged together, get equipped together to talk about how we can live out this life of Christ. But we need to begin to see that the work of God is happening in our everyday life. God primarily does his work in the world through the church, not in the church. The followers of Jesus are the church, and we gather to be equipped and to encourage each other, to celebrate each other, to support each other. But we leave this building to build his kingdom in the places he has strategically put us every other day of the week. Now, think about what you did last week for a minute. Just do a little thought experiment with me. How did you spend your week? Take a couple of minutes to think about your average day. Now, answer this question. What percentage of what you did was spiritual? And what percentage of what you did was second? Think about it. You can come up with a percentage. It's, it's a trick question, really. Because everything you did was spiritual. See, our tendency is to think about, like, oh, going to church, that's spiritual. Maybe reading my Bible or praying, that's spiritual. Everything else is secular. You know, like, that's not, what it, that's not where I follow Jesus at. But Jesus is trying to get his followers to see that ordinary lives are spiritual moments, too. In Jesus, everything is spiritual. That's why you pick ordinary people doing ordinary things and not the elite religious students of his day. We are always building the kingdom of darkness or building the kingdom of light. And that's not just spending church services and doing churchy spiritual things, right? Everything is an opportunity for spiritual growth and good. Ordinary people like us doing seemingly ordinary things changes the world. Now, Jesus continues walking along the Sea of Galilee, and he sees two more brothers fishing, 
and he invites them to follow him as well. And an invitation to follow Jesus is an invitation to do what he does, to be with him and do what he does. To follow Jesus is to mimic who he is and what he does. You can't say you follow Jesus if you don't act like he does, if you don't follow him, when you don't live and love like he did. And the result of them following that him is that they leave something behind. Peter and Andrew left their nets. James and John leave their boat and their father. And the, the idea of following isn't a complicated idea, right? Children play follow the leader, and we're not like, wow, look at this complicated gang. Like, this is really advanced. These kids are geniuses. Like, it's a simple idea, but it's also a costly idea. When you follow someone, it's an invitation to give up control in your life. If to follow means you're not in charge, you're not in control, you don't set the direction or the agenda for your life. That can be really frustrating when there's something you want to do and the leader says no. Or that can be really frustrating when there's somewhere you don't want to go and the leader says go. But following is also incredibly freeing. Um, when I'm feeling the pressure and the stress, it's often because I'm trying to be king instead of following the king. Uh, the last three weeks that we've been online, I'm like, oh, man, this is this is hurting momentum. This is gonna hurt. Like, oh, people are gonna be out of the habit of coming. You know, like I'm going through all this stuff in my head. And uh, gently, maybe in between some like, uh, you know, medication coma and some sickness, um, I heard the still small voice of the Holy Spirit remind me. He goes, since when have you been in charge? I was like, oh yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, this isn't my church. This isn't your church. Like, this thing wouldn't be here if it wasn't because of you, not because of me. You asked me to come and be a part of what you're doing, and I'm grateful to do that. But when I'm feeling the pressure and the stress, it's revealing that I'm trying to run my life instead of trying to follow someone who's in control, who's leading the way. I think the directions and the agenda for my life depend on me instead of him so often, and I have to go back and remind myself, I'm a follower. I'm following him. He's the leader. Following Jesus, though, always means leaving something behind. But whatever we leave behind to follow Jesus is always inferior to what we are receiving in him. So what did following Jesus look like? What did it practically look like? They were with him and did what he did. It's a real complex definition, right? They spent time with him, and they did what he did. What did he do? What did he spend his time doing? Verse 23 tells us Jesus went to where people were. He taught his way of life based on the Old Testament. He proclaimed the good news of his kingdom, and he healed hurting people. To be a disciple means we need to do the same tasks. We need to go to where people are. We need to teach them about what the scriptures say. We need to proclaim to them the good news of the kingdom of God, and we need to heal hurting people. That's what it means to follow Jesus, to do what he did. Now, as American churches, we tend to fixate on one aspect, one area at least, and ignore the other ones. And uh, you can probably think of some churches that are really good at one of these and ignore the other ones. You could probably think about Horizon, how sometimes we're good at one of these and sometimes we need to grow in some of the other areas. Some churches have become all about teaching the Bible, and they're like, we're just going to give people good knowledge and everything else will work out. And they ignore why the good news even matters to people. Um, some churches become all about the good news and the pronouncement about God's rule and reign and how anybody's welcome. And they ignore how the teachings of Jesus affect us before we die and right here today. And some churches become all about helping the hurting and ignoring the spiritual needs of people far away from God. There's some great churches who do amazing things in the community, but they never really get around to talking about the Bible or maybe how that might impact you spiritually. To follow Jesus, we need all these elements. To be a good, healthy church, we need all these elements. Now, the result of him doing these things is that a large crowd of people began to follow Jesus. Jesus had some fans. He's, he's drawing big crowds. People are coming out to hear him and see him, to be healed by him. But fans are fickle, right? Just as any Philadelphia sports team. Fans are fickle. They can be your best of friends and your worst of enemies. The same crowd right now that's like, Jesus is awesome, I love him. Some of those same people would later shout, crucify him. And as, he, uh, as we read off this list here, he had followers from um, 
go back to it, sorry. He had followers from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, Jordan, and the Decapolis. Uh, and you probably recognize some of those. You're like, oh man, there's a bunch of Jewish cities that I recognize from the Bible, from hearing about in the news. One that I was less familiar with was the Decapolis. Does anybody know what that is? No, I didn't either. So you're, you're in good company. It, it comes from a Greek word which means ten city. And it was a list of ten cities. We have a list of those ten cities up here. Um, and both of them exist, or some of them still exist today, but they sit in modern day Jordan, Syria, and Israel. And there's a list of the people there. These were Gentile towns that Jesus was attracting followers from. It wasn't just Jews who saw Jesus. That's the long way he came. It was Gentiles too who recognized in him a new way of living life. A new way of saying, oh, this is what it means to be human, and this is a better way of life. Um, so these huge crowds were following Jesus, and after this, in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, which will be our next section, we'll jump into in a few months, Jesus sits down and says, okay, now that I have all these followers following me, let me talk to you about what it looks like to live and love like me. Let me talk to you about what it looks like to be my student, to be my disciple, to be an apprentice of my way of life. It's in really his manifesto for his kingdom and what it looks like to be a citizen of his kingdom. Uh, we often call this manifesto the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to look at it really in depth later in the year. But as I was reading over these uh, list of ten cities, the first one up there is Philadelphia. Not this Philadelphia, but a modern day Amman, the capital of Jordan. Um, but I just love that, that Jesus was calling followers from Philadelphia. And Jesus is still calling followers to follow him in Philadelphia today, right here, right now. Jesus is inviting you and me, come follow me. Don't just say you like me. Don't just be a fan. I'm glad you agree with some of the things that I say or you think they're good. But come and practice them. Come and model me. Come and follow my leadership. That invitation, though, always means leaving something behind in order to receive something better. Maybe it means leaving behind a net, a boat, a family member, or in more modern terms, maybe dreams about the future, your career, a loved one. As we end our series in Matthew for now, I want us to really ponder this question, especially as we're about to take communion together. Am I a fan of Jesus Christ? Do I agree with him? Or am I a follower? Do I really try to live and love like him? Lord Jesus, thank you for coming and inviting us into your life, to follow you, to model our lives on yours, to receive the Holy Spirit and become co-heirs with you. God, forgive me for so often uh, just verbally agreeing with you to mentally assenting to your gospel. Say, yeah, that's right, that's good. So many times I hear messages or I hear someone post, or see someone post something or hear someone say something, and I'm like, yes, that's good, I agree with it. And I go on about my life and I don't change anything. I don't actually practice it. I don't actually do it. I'm a fan and not a follower. Now this morning we're celebrating community together. I was sick and tired of eating the super dry wafers and the little like disgusting juice cup. And so we have some fresh juice back there. We can grab a cup and some slices of bread. We can grab a slice of bread. And Jesus told his followers, his disciples, to do this to remember him. To remember his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. It's a way to remember that we're followers of the way that he lived in love. We're not just
And like I said, you get to Monday and you're at work and you're like, what does this look like? How is this any different than how anyone else lives? And so we're talking about how the spiritual disciplines of Jesus give us the spiritual muscles to live and love like Jesus. By practicing what he practiced, we can live like he lived. And in January, we talked about the practice of prayer. In February, we're focusing on the practice of scripture. And we're encouraging you to read through the book of Matthew with us. This month, there's 28 chapters in Matthew, and there's 28 days in February. So it lines up real nicely. I'm a couple days behind. I'm going to catch up later on this afternoon um, from this week. Um, but to help you in that, we've bought some free journals back here on the connect table. Um, there's some nice glossy black ones because I like things to be plain and boring. And then there's some beautifully illustrated <laughs> ones because Darby said those were boring. Um, and so you pick whichever one you want. And it has a journaling section. So as you read through Matthew, you can write down your thoughts and your prayers, your hopes. We really want this practice of scripture to not simply be about reading to gain information, which is like what we're sure about, sure about the best, right? We read something, we're like, I've got that information, we throw it out. Scripture is different. We read it not just to get information, but to encounter a person. We want to read slowly. We want to meditate on key words and verses. We need to pray through it. And then we need to sit over the passage and ask God to speak. And so we hope that this journal uh, it gives you an opportunity to write down what you hear God say, uh, what you hear Him speaking to you as you read. We're starting a new series next week. We're going to take a break from the book of Matthew, which we'll pick up later this year in Matthew. We're going to talk about deconstruction, which is very much a buzzword in our culture right now. Um, and I'm going to talk about it, what I think is good about it, what I think is bad about it. And ultimately, what I want us to do is to build a firm foundation on the essential elements of our faith and realize the areas where sometimes we've picked up baggage along the way from our faith communities or from people who are well-meaning, uh, who they told us some things that were true about Jesus, but then they also added on some baggage that um, isn't from scripture or isn't from a faith tradition. And we've all kind of picked up this baggage. I, I asked Darby for an example where I was gonna take a bunch of yarn and have a red thread and all these different yarn. And she said, don't mess up my yarn. I was like, this is gonna be such a great example for the new series. And I was like, she was, please don't mess up my yarn. So I don't have that. Example. But imagine this ball of yarn of all these different colors yarn, but there's this red thread through it. And you're like, I know that red thread is what I need, but I've got all this other junk like tied up in that. And we've all done that with our faith and our, our religion. Like we have this thread that's Jesus and who he is and what he's about, and then we have all this other stuff. And so it's gonna be a series about like, how do we get back to the core elements of what it means to be a follower of Jesus? And then how do we realize that some of this stuff that we've held to really strongly actually isn't in scripture or isn't essential to the faith? Um, and so I'm very excited about this series. I hope you are as well. So up next we have our uh, core values at Horizon, we are people-driven, community-focused, Jesus-centered, team-defined, and we exist to equip people to live and love like Jesus. That's all of us. If you're a first-time visitor, we donate $25 to Compassion International, so thanks for being here, for watching online. And if you'd like to give, um, we are so grateful for your generous support of the work we do at Horizon. You can give online via Venmo or PayPal or on the box by the door. I pray that this week, Jesus inspires you to be more than a fan and to become a follower. He's worth following. Have a great week, everyone.